Good morning. I'm trying to get this mask to disengage. Well, okay, there it is. Good morning. <laughs> it is, uh, it is uh, good to see you all this morning and just ignore the thing hanging from my right ear. Um, it is so great to see you all who are here in person uh, as, uh, as we've, we're going to say for a long time, I think, we have missed you and glad that you're here. And we're so glad that you've joined us, those who are uh, worshiping online, glad that you've joined us as well. Uh, we're continuing our uh, safety precautions of mask wearing and, and uh, the choir behind plexiglass and all of that. We continue to follow the advice of our public health officials, and, and so we're continuing uh, in, in that way. Uh, and so glad that you're here to, uh, to, to worship with us today. So glad that you're joining us on this Sunday. Um, also, um, if you're at home, I invite you to prepare your worship space. Uh, you can prepare for communion today. We're receiving communion uh, here in the sanctuary. Uh, and at home, find something that's bread or bread-like and uh, juice or juice-like that, uh, that you can partake of the elements uh, as we do so here in the sanctuary. And also, uh, as the candles are lighted here in the sanctuary, as we symbolically celebrate the presence of Christ with us in this place, I invite you to do that in your worship space at home as well. So glad that you've joined us for worship. And now let's prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God. Thank you. 
Well, friends, in the sanctuary, I want to invite you to stand right now. You are standing for a segment that will include our call to worship and opening prayer and our opening hymn. Uh, for that hymn, those of us here in the sanctuary will be humming along with Choral Union who are singing the hymn. For those of you worshiping at home, uh, you will be singing with gusto in your homes. Uh, in the, your words will be on the screen at home. And for us here in the sanctuary, you should have a copy of the bulletin as well as all the words being on the screen. So let's begin now with the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. And yet, our spirits can wander through the night and cry out with fear. Help us, O oh God, to trust that you will break the chains of our imperfections. Good and loving God, we confess that we are not perfect people. Too often we task ourselves with sorting who is in and who is out, those who belong inside our walls and those who belong on the fringes. We cast out entire individuals, ignoring the things that torment them in order to make ourselves feel safe. Forgive us and move us forward. Teach us to be a community and people of faith who practice the type of love and forgiveness that you freely offer us the love that includes and invites, the love that breaks chains and frees our spirits to the lives you call us into. Amen. As we remain standing, let us now affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us, we are not alone. Thanks be to God, amen.
Please be seated. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Jesus and his disciples came to the other side of the lake, to the region of the Gerasenes. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out of the tombs. This man lived among the tombs and no one was ever strong enough to restrain him, even with a chain. He had been secured many times with leg irons and chains, but he broke the chains and smashed the leg irons. No one was tough enough to control him. Night and day, in the tombs and the hills, he would howl and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from far away, he ran and knelt before him shouting, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. He said this because Jesus had already commanded him, unclean spirit, come out of the man. Jesus asked him, what is your name? He responded, legion is my name because we are many. They pleaded with Jesus not to send them out of that region. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside. Send us into pigs, they begged. Let us go into the pigs. Jesus gave them permission. So the unclean spirits left the man and went into the pigs. Then the herd of about 2,000 pigs rushed down the cliff into the lake and drowned. Those who tended the pigs ran away and told the story in the city and the countryside. People came to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who used to be demon-possessed. They saw the very man who had been filled with many demons sitting there fully dressed and completely sane, and they were filled with awe. Those who had actually seen what had happened to the demon-possessed man told the others about the pigs. Then they pleaded with Jesus to leave their region. While he was climbing into the boat, the one who had been demon-possessed pleaded with Jesus to let him come alone as one of his disciples. But Jesus wouldn't allow it. Go home to your own people, Jesus said, and tell them what the Lord has done for you and how he has shown you mercy. The man went away and began to proclaim in the 10 cities all that Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. God speaks to us through the reading of the scripture. Thanks be to God. That's a very interesting story. I'm a children's minister, and my job is to explore Bible truths and the great stories with children. Last week, I got Jonah. This week, demons, chains, and pigs for kids. Um, those of you who have your Lent kits either here in person or at home, I'd invite you to find the chain, right? And grown-ups, there are some other things. Just make sure the kids don't root around too much in there. There is salt, there's grape juice, there's vinegar, the makings of a very good marinade, but we don't want to marinate this worship service. So just the chain for now. Be careful, it's a little pokey. And just hold that chain. We just heard a story about a man and chains. And you know, there's a lot of stories throughout history that involve people and chains, and it's almost never a good thing, is it? People and chains. And this man is by himself around where the tombs are, and he's hurting, he's in pain, and people put him in chains, and he breaks, whatever it is that's hurting him is so powerful that he's able to break those chains but he doesn't go to hurt other people when, once he breaks those chains. What does he do? He harms himself. He hurts himself. And then along comes Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say, well, I guess we just need bigger, stronger chains. And Jesus doesn't say, well, just get over it. We're all going through hard stuff. These are hard times. Just rub some dirt on it. Get over it. It's not that bad. 
Jesus kind of teaches us one of, the, one of the most important things, that we lift other people up not by telling them how small their problems are, but by showing them how big love can be. And what does Jesus do? He sits with that man in his pain. Jesus acknowledges his pain. Jesus talks to his pain, and his pain talks back. And not through admonishment, not through chains, not through isolation, but through grace and through love, Jesus is able to get him to let go of what is hurting him, to let go. And when he's able to let go of what is hurting him, there's now space inside for Jesus to be in his heart. That poor dear man has Jesus in his heart, and it doesn't mean bad things aren't gonna happen to him again in life, but on the inside, he's got what it takes, a loving friend and savior, Jesus. We've all got stuff inside us that, that hurts us on the inside that would be, if we could just let go of some of it, we could heal more. I think about forgiveness. I think about grudges. Kids, a grudge is whenever someone has done you wrong, hurt your feelings, hurt your body, and you're mad. And that's okay to be mad about that because you, 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 you deserve to not be hurt. But you let that, that anger and that resentment build, and you're like, oh, I'll just show them. I'll keep being angry at that person. And you carry it around. And who are you hurting the most when that happens? Yourself. So let's, let's, let's close with what I call a grudge prayer, where we can actively choose to let go of those things that are hurting us on the inside. So here's what I want us to do. Everybody, every child, and everyone with a child inside, which is all of you, let's think about someone who has done us wrong. Okay, that didn't take long. And now I want you to put your hand on your heart right here, and I want you to rub until that grudge comes all the way to the surface. And you may be thinking, Mr. Mark, we don't have that kind of time. Well, we'll just try, all right? And I want you to rub, 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 until that grudge comes all the way to the surface. And when it comes, I want you to grab it, hold on to it, do not let it go, and pull it out of your heart because it's hurting your heart. It's harming you. Now, we are going to practice forgiveness. And forgiveness does not mean pretending that the hurt doesn't happen. It doesn't mean pretending that, that someone didn't hurt you. And it doesn't mean accepting that others can hurt you and that it's okay. It's not. What it is is a decision to let go of that anger and resentment so that you can go on with the important work of becoming the best person you possibly can and growing closer with God. And repeat after me, God forgives and so can I. I forgive. No, really, I forgive. And now open it up and blow that grudge away. Bye-bye, grudge. Amen. I was hoping that Mr. Mark could introduce the phrase no really into the service today. So that was just perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here today. Uh, Dr. B has welcomed you already, but we are connecting as a worshiping community, com community from at least three different sources. Those of you here in the congregation, we're just so happy to see you here. And it was great to see people at 930 here during the gathering. For those of you who are live streaming this morning, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I hope that you know that you, there's a bulletin that you can download. Uh, I hope you know that you can register your attendance, you can share prayer requests, you can uh, do your offering this morning, and we thank you for all those things. Some of you are here this morning because of Facebook Live, and we're really grateful for that. Um, I think, Mr. Mark has fired up his laptop, so he would love to chat with you on Facebook Live in the main office. The great Donna Smith is on Facebook Live. Uh, they want to connect with you, and we want to connect with you. So thank you so much for being here. You know, during the pandemic, technology has become so important. And 
The website of our church, fumcfw.org, is so very important. And I always want to remind you, go to the homepage of our website for all the information that can be helpful to give you daily devotionals, to give you all the study opportunities, to, to give you great stories about how people are seeing God among us. Uh, you can also go to the website to make your reservation for worship. The vast majority of you here today in the sanctuary did that, no doubt. So, you know already that you can make your weekly worship reservation on the website for 9.30 or 11 o'clock. I also want you to know that you can make your reservations now for Holy Week and Easter. Uh, Easter is on Sunday, April 4th, so back up just a few days. You can, re you can make your reservation now for the evening service for Maundy Thursday. You can make your reservation for Good Friday. You can make your reservation for one of four worship services on Easter. Now, here's a quick description. At 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 o'clock, each one of those worship services will feature the music of DFW Brass and our own choral union. At those first three services, Dr. B is going to preach at 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock, and Reverend Lance Marshall will be preaching at 9.30. Now, if we go to the one o'clock service, that service is going to be in the worship style of the gathering. So music will be provided by the great gathering band. Lance will be preaching again at one o'clock. And I'll tell you a secret, if we need to open up a fifth service later in the afternoon, we're gonna do it. And we are going to be excited about it. So now is the time for you to make your reservations for Easter. And we thank you for doing that. Now is the time for us to turn our attention slightly to stage left to where Dr. Genia Garina Rodriguez is sitting right now. She was working earlier reading the scripture to us. She'll be leading us uh, through communion a bit later with Dr. B. This is a big week in her life and in her family's life because this week, Jania is beginning a maternity leave. She's going to be away for a few months because one way or another, Jania's little girl is going to enter the world this week and become part of your family. And we want you to know that we love you, our prayers are with you, our enthusiasm is with you, and we can't wait to see pictures. So if you would, join me now in letting Jania know how much we love and care for her. Now, let's show a little more love right now because today is the 46th anniversary of the very first live television broadcast of a worship service of First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Think about that. In fact, here is the date, March 2nd, 1975, from 11 a.m. in a few seconds up until 11.59 in a few seconds, the very first live service of this church went out initially to the Metroplex and then as the years went along, uh, out really to the entire country. Uh, I have heard stories of that first year and how there were cables running from trucks from Channel 11 that went up the outside of the building and in third, through third floor uh, restrooms and to the TV studio. And this is literally true. We have volunteers. We've had hundreds of volunteers over the years in television ministry and media ministry. Some of those volunteers in 1975 were in high school. Some of them still volunteer. Some of them still give their leadership to that incredible ministry. And we know that during the pandemic for the last year, we know how important technology has been. And it is because of the media ministry of this church 
for 46 years. So I want to do this in, in two movements. Movement number one, those of you in the sanctuary, let's put our hands together as enthusiastically as you can for our media ministry team. And friends at home, we're with you and we're joining you now. So everyone in the sanctuary is going to join you now in enthusiastically waving back and forth, waving and congratulating our media ministry and saying, Thank you, thank you, oh, thank you. What a great day this is. Every Sunday that we worship is a great day. It's an opportunity for us to, to say to God, thank you for all the blessings that you give us and thank you for the opportunities you give us to bless others. And so those of you in the sanctuary this morning, when it comes to our financial gifts, I want to remind you that uh, there are black boxes all over the sanctuary. If you'd like to give a gift before you leave today, you're able to do that. You can use your QR code. You can go on the website at any time. In addition to your generous weekly gifts, now is the time that many of you are giving a second mile gift to our Easter offering. Uh, that is completely dedicated to outreach. It goes to Methodist Justice Ministries and First Street Methodist Mission and Dementia Ministries and our community outreach support uh, that includes so many things. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, what you do makes an incredible difference. And so in just a moment, we are going to celebrate blessings and generosity through this anthem from Choral Union. And before we do that, let us pray. Oh God, thank you for blessing us to be blessings for others. Thank you for drawing us into a community. May we give all of ourselves with enthusiasm and may we do so in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, what a beautiful message. Come to me, Jesus said. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Beautiful words for us to remember as we're in this series, series Darkest Before Dawn, um, that we sometimes carry heavy burdens, but we have one who is able to uh, carry the burden with us. Um, and in this time of the pandemic, uh, it is a time that is often described as a very dark time. This are dark days, but we can certainly see light ahead. Um, and in the season of Lent, which is a time, uh, a season that is kind of dark, uh, we know that Easter's coming and uh, that death gives way to resurrection uh, and that difficulty gives way uh, to um, a life beyond that difficulty. So today, in this series, we um, have met a, a remarkable man, a remarkable person, uh, one who, if, um, if you just saw him as he is at the end of our scripture reading for today, sitting there, uh, talking with Jesus, uh, sitting there fully clothed uh, and calm, it would be hard to believe what, where his journey had been. And, and he's a remarkable man because years before the apostle Paul, think about it, this man was a missionary to the Gentiles. He was one that went and shared the news, shared his story about what God had done for him in Jesus. A remarkable person. I want you to think about the life uh, that, uh, that he lived uh, and what he struggled with. Today we would call it uh, mental illness. Um, he, he struggled with uh, feeling torn in a lot of different directions. He, he was fearful of people and people were fearful of him. So tormented was he that eventually his clothes became rags and they just sort of disintegrated and he was naked. And he lived among the tombs and he cried and howled night and day and cut himself so he could feel something. Imagine the pain of this man. He had a family, but um, for sure the family must have sort of given up on him. Um, and there he was, living alone among the tombs. It, it reminds me, several years ago, I was talking to a man in his 20s, homeless man, and from our conversation, it was clear that, uh, that he uh, suffered from mental illness um, that undoubtedly led to his homelessness. And I asked him in the course of that conversation, so where, where are you sleeping at night? Do you have shelter? Uh, do you know about the Presbyterian night shelter? And just sort of talking to him about, and he said, no, I mostly sleep in the cemetery. I said, why? And he said, I sleep in the cemetery because nobody bothers me there. Everybody leaves me alone. And you wonder about this man who lived among the tombs. Is that why? So nobody would bother him. I mean, there were stories about him. The, the man who lives among the tombs who howls and cuts himself and they tried to restrain him with chains and he broke the chains. And I'm sure the stories got bigger and bigger about the man who lives among the tombs. Children would talk about the man and scare each other with the stories. He sort of had his place in the community He's the man that lives among the tombs. He's, he's the one that's scary and the one that we stay away from and the one we tell stories about. Imagine that life. And then one day, this man named Jesus shows up doing something really unusual. I mean, we sort of take it for granted if we're familiar with the gospel stories at all. We take it for granted that Jesus was all the way, all the time going over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The other side of the lake, that's Gentile territory. Nobody keeps kosher over there. In fact, they even herd nasty, unkosher pigs over on the other side. 
But Jesus took his disciples over there to the region of the Decapolis, the 10 cities. Those are Greco-Roman cities, they're not Jewish cities. Very different people over there and Jesus would take his disciples over there all the time so they would rub shoulders with people different from themselves. So in this particular case, Jesus loads his disciples into the boat. They go out onto the lake, the Sea of Galilee, and a storm arises. They're terrified. Jesus calms the storm, and their adrenaline is just starting to subside as they pull up to the shore, and out comes this man howling and screaming and running toward them. And the adrenaline probably goes back up for those disciples but not for Jesus, Jesus knows how he suffers and the man falls at his feet and said, what, says, what have you to do with us? Jesus, son of God, don't torment me. Afraid of God, afraid of other people is this man, he falls at the feet of Jesus and Jesus asks him a question, what is your name? See, in biblical terms and in that culture, your name really says something about who you are. It captures something of the essence of you. It's like Simon, the, the disciple. Jesus gives him a new name, Peter, which means a rock, uh, one who is steady and firm a name that certainly Simon needed to live into because most of the time he was anything but that. But Jesus could see it in him. And he asked this man, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Legion is a Latin term. It, it refers to six, a unit of 6,000 Roman soldiers. 6,000. My name is Legion, for we are many, it says. Legion. He must have seen Roman soldiers marching to and fro up and down the countryside, enforcing the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And he said, that's my name, because I'm many. H.G. Wells said of this man, he's not so much a personality as a battlefield. And I think it's safe to say that all of us in this room and everyone who is worshiping with us online, it's not as dramatic for us, but don't we know something of what that's like? what it's like to wrestle with what's good and what's bad, to, to, to be sometimes one person in this group and one in another. I think I've shared with you before, Bishop A. Frank Smith used to say, and this is back in the day when all the clergy were men, so you'll forgive the language. But he says, the hardest thing, of, he said, the hardest thing about being a preacher's wife is living with him six days a week and believing him to be the voice of God on the seventh. Do I get an amen back there? She's nodding her head. Because that's the way it is to be a human being. And, and sometimes we can become more fragmented than at other times, and we can have that sense of, well, who am I? It feels like I'm, 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 I'm legion. And then Jesus makes him whole. And it's a strange story. The, the demons are cast into a herd of swine, 2,000 of them, and they run down a cliff and they are drowned in the sea. And then the next scene, here is this man fully clothed, sitting there, just looking normal. It's an amazing transformation. And the people of the town see him and they're their reaction is, our translation said awe, some translations say they were afraid. But either way, they were awestruck by what they saw. I mean, he's out of place. This can't be the same man that was naked living among the tombs and howling and cutting himself, but here he is, transformed, 
made new. And you would think that they would have a party and they would celebrate, and this would be great news that this man has been made new. That's not the reaction. In fact, the reaction is to beg Jesus to leave them. It's almost like they're saying the same thing he said at first. Jesus, Son of God, what do you have to do with us? Get, get out of here. We're uncomfortable with you. You have cost us money, 2,000 pigs. See, the reality is they cared more about the pigs than they cared about the man. And he picks up on that because what does he do? Jesus, oh, all right, he, he leaves. And when Jesus is leaving, the man begs Jesus to take him with him. Do you blame him? I mean, it's pretty evident that they care more about those pigs than, hey, folks, I'm, I'm transformed. I'm, I'm new. Look at this. Yeah, but we're worried about the pigs and what that's cost us. And, and sure, he wants to go with Jesus, this one who has transformed his life, this one who has listened to him and talked to him and asked him his name and all that and, and transformed him. But Jesus said, no, I want you to go and tell your story throughout the, the Decapolis, the 10 cities. Go home and tell your story. And that's why I said at the beginning, here we have the first missionary to the Gentiles, really, way before the Apostle Paul. But he shares something, or Paul shares something in common with this man, because Paul, in the seventh chapter of Romans, just to say that we all have these, this sense of need and the sense of being made whole and transformed by, by Jesus, forgiven and given new life. Paul wrote in the seventh chapter of Romans, the desire to do good is inside of me, but I can't do it. I, I don't do the good that I want to do, but I do the evil that I don't want to do. <clears throat> but, but, but if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it is sin that lives inside me that's doing it. So I find that as a rule, when I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. I gladly agree with the law on the inside, but I see a different law at work in my body. It, it wages a war. Do you hear it? Legion? Battlefield? It wages a war against the law of my mind and, and, and takes me prisoner with the law of sin that is in my body. I, I'm a miserable human being. Who will deliver me from this dead corpse? I mean, that is quite a statement from Paul. But here's his answer. Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who transforms, the one who sets free, the one who forgives, the one who makes new. John Killinger uh, told a story of a man who found himself alone in a hotel room in Canada, a successful man. He, but he lived a really high pressure life and he was a worrier, always worrying and consumed with, with his business and his family and his children. And he reported even with his dogs, worried about his dogs, always worrying and carrying a heavy burden. And, and, and so he got to this place where he didn't even feel like going downstairs to eat. And he was just ready for life to end. And out loud, he said, God, is this a joke? I mean, is, is life really just a joke? And then it occurred to him, he recounted later, that it was the first time he had talked to God in years. And he thought he'd give it a try and continue to talk to God. And so he continued to just sort of lay it out, the, his fears and his worries and his, the burden he was carrying and, and all that was going on. And he just talked to God in that way. And then he said, 
I, I heard a voice. Well, it was almost like, it was kind of like a voice. And it was clear, and it said, it doesn't have to be this way. So he went home, when he got home, and he told his wife about the story. He said, do you think, by chance, that's the voice that God was speaking to me? And his brother, a, a pastor, called up his brother, and he told him the story. And he said, do you think God was speaking to me? And his brother said, well, I can tell you this. That is the message that God has for you and for everybody else. It doesn't have to be this way. And I wonder, it was certainly true for the Apostle Paul years later, but I wonder if it's also true of that remarkable man who went out through all the cities of the Decapolis and he told his story, and when people would describe what was going on with them and their struggles, he would say, it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to be at war with yourself. You don't have to be at war with others or at war with God. It doesn't have to be that way. That's the good news of our faith. When we come to the Lord's table, we are remembering all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We're celebrating that. We're coming to the table to remember and to celebrate. That it doesn't have to, whatever it is, however dark it is, it doesn't have to be that way. Because of the love and the grace of God in Christ. Amen. This is the special time in our worship service when we will participate in the Holy Communion. Lord's table is open for all. Now I invite you to prepare the elements at home if you're worshiping with us online. Just use bread or something like bread or juice or something like juice. For those of you who are in the sanctuary here with us, the uh, elements are in the pews and if you don't have one, if you need one, just raise your hand and an usher is gonna bring you uh, the elements. Here now the invitation to the communion. All of the responses are gonna be on the screen in the sanctuary, on your screens at home, and also in the bulletins. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of 
of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, and after giving thanks to you, he gave it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood, the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and those who are gathered in many different places in worship. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> and now with the confidence of children of God, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to take the bread. Remembering that this is the bread of life, the body of Christ, broken for you. And I invite you to take the cup. Remembering that this is the cup of blessing, the blood of Christ shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins.
Absolutely beautiful. As we prepare to conclude our worship service, um, many of you saw Lisa Helm, our Director of Welcoming Ministries, flying around here in the sanctuary before this service. She was wearing that yellow Ask Me badge, and she was moving around helping to connect some of you who are new here today with others that she knows it would benefit for you to meet them and, and learn about how they're connected. My invitation this morning is let us help you. We would be honored to help you remain connected or become connected in our church, whether it's Lisa or myself or any member of the staff. Uh, please contact us and we look forward to getting to know you better and helping you become a disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. With all that in mind, I invite those of you here in the sanctuary to stand as we offer wonderful music to God. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen. Please be seated.